from protein, you then went down to branch chain amino acids. So just these three. Now, kind of before we get into what you saw, could we talk a little bit about branch chain amino acids? So why are they special? And why did you pick them first of all as the ones you wanted to study? Sure. So most people are probably familiar with branch chain amino acids because a lot of dietary supplements uh, contain extra BCAAs. And, you know, people use them when they are working out, um, particularly people who are endurance athletes or who are trying to build lots of skeletal muscle. Um, branch amino acids is definitely very important in building um, skeletal muscle. And one limitation of our studies thus far is that we're pretty much looking not at people or mice that are athletic, but instead we're looking at the other end of the spectrum, right? So 70% of people in the U.S. are either overweight or obese. And you know, our mice are probably a pretty good model um, for sedentary people. So that's one limitation of our, of our research. Um, the reason we started looking at BCAAs was twofold. So one is my background is that um, I was very interested in mTOR protein kinase signal, and um, that is very heavily agonized by the branched amino acids. So branched amino acids turn on mTOR signaling, and we thought that would be interesting. Um, but there's also a better reason too, which is that branched chain amino acids have been known for a long time, since about 1969, to be metabolically interesting. And by interesting, it was, it was shown in the late 1960s that branched chain amino acids are elevated in the blood of people who are obese or have diabetes. And subsequent work has not only shown that, but it's extended it to various different types of rodent models of obesity as well. Um, interventions that tend to promote weight loss in people tend to lower branch chain amino acid levels. So not just dieting, but things like gastric bypass surgery. And in fact, in our human study of protein restriction with Dr. Fontana, we found that branch chain amino acids selectively went down in the blood of people who are on a protein restricted diet. And other amino acids like methionine, which is supposed to uh, contribute to some of the beneficial effects of a vegetarian diet or vegan diet, that didn't actually change at all in our protein restricted um, humans. So something really interesting is going on with the branched chain amino acids. And that's why we decided to dive into that. Okay. So a little bit on actually branched chain amino acids and, and mTOR. Uh, so are branched chain amino acids required to build muscle? So if you don't have them, and, but you do have other protein, can you still build muscle? So uh, there are nine essential amino acids. Three of them are the branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, and if you don't have them if, if in your diet, um, eventually bad things, very bad things will happen. And that's true for both rodents and humans. So we never look at diets or very rarely look at diets anyway, where we're taking away all the branched chain amino acids because that's not physiologically relevant. So in our study, we use a paradigm in our mouse models where we restrict branch chain amino acids by two thirds or 67%. Um, for mice, that seems to be perfect nutritionally sufficient. Um, for humans, um, most people, and this is something we calculated um, for a very small uh, study we did in humans, most people who tend to be overweight or obese probably are eating about four times the RDA of branched chain amino acids. So there's a lot of room even in the human diet to probably cut branched chain amino acid intake particularly when we're talking about people who are metabolically unhealthy. So my understanding, my simple understanding was that basically leucine was the amino acid that mTORC1 sensed, right? Do the other branch chain amino acids also activate mTOR or does it need to be leucine? That's, a, that's actually a very complicated question. Um, but I think, you know, for the purposes of our discussion, we can say that leucine is by far the best um, activator of mTOR, um, mTOR complex one in most cells. So it, mTOR is, it senses like glucose as well, like insulin and proteins, and it kind of feels that it needs both to activate. W would you say that is correct? So if you have low, low insulin, but you still have high protein, would mTOR still be down? The sort of conventional model is that you need both growth factor signaling as well as nutrient signaling. And so one arm of this would be you need proteins and glucose and oxygen and cellular energy is sensed by via the mitochondria. You need to have sort of pro-nutrient state. And you also need a permissive environment for growth, which is usually going to be insulin or IGF-1 signaling. Some other things feed in via that pathway as well. In the context of a person, 
right? You always have some insulin in your blood. You always have some amino acids and glucose in your blood. And so from that perspective, there's probably always going to be some mTOR signaling that's that can happen. It, whether it does or not probably depends on a lot of things. And certainly mTOR activity goes up and down during the course of the day and spikes when you eat. Right. So can we kind of look at the mouse studies that you ran with, uh, with the brass chain amino acids? So you, you cut the brass chain amino acids by two thirds. Can you talk a little bit about what the outcome was that you saw in, in those studies? Sure, we've done a number of studies and I'll sort of take them in order. So the first thing we wanted to know was, you know, were the branched chain amino acids really responsible for some of the effects of a low protein diet? And so looking at metabolically, we found that when we restricted branched chain amino acids, we saw many of the same effects that we did in a low protein diet. Um, so we found that the mice are leaner, they're more glucose tolerant. Um, overall, they seem to be um, metabolically quite healthier, much healthier. Um, and when we looked in the context of obesity, uh, diet-induced obesity, where we took mice and made them fat, um, we could switch them to amino acid-defined Western diets. So these diets are still energy dense, high in fat and sucrose, you know, very unhealthy, but they had lower levels of branched chain amino acids. Again, we can like specifically lower the levels of those branched amino acids while keeping pretty much everything else constant um, because we're using these defined diets that we make for mice. Um, and when we did, we found some really cool effects. So basically we are able to take a mouse that's um, overweight, quite obese, um, has insulin resistance, and just three weeks on a low branch amino acid diet turns that mouse into a thin mouse, um, even though they're eating large quantities of this high fat, high sucrose, metabolically unhealthy diet. Um, and with the weight loss, they primarily lose fat mass, lean mass is largely maintained, they become much more glucose tolerant and insulin sensitive. And, you know, if we could make that work as well in humans, it would be an incredible, uh, you know, therapy for people who are overweight or obese, you know, probably we probably it's not going to be that easy, but, uh, you know, definitely those were some really exciting effects. And then in subsequent studies, we looked at the role of each of the individual branch amino acids in this fact, these effects, as well as their effects on lifespan and longevity. But I'll just pause here in case you wanted to discuss the first parts. It's, so I was just thinking, I mean, we have impossible beef, right? Impossible burgers, which are largely constituted. So presumably you could build one of those with low branch chain amino acids. You could. And in fact, in our subsequent studies, we've gone on to look at the individual amino acids. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, we were quite surprised because as you pointed out, leucine is well known to be the sort of, you know, best mTOR activator by far. Um, but leucine doesn't really seem to be involved in the metabolic effects that we looked at. In fact, uh, even if you cut leucine by 85% or more, you get very few metabolic benefits. And so what our subsequent, more recent studies showed was that the key mediator of these effects seems to be isoleucine and to a small extent, valine. And in fact, isoleucine restriction is a really powerful uh, metabolic has really powerful metabolic effects. So where we, when we just restrict isoleucine, we get pretty much all the benefits of protein restriction. And also it's essential for the effects of protein restriction. So if you take a protein restricted mouse and you add isoleucine back to its diet, you blunt all the effects of protein restriction. And so isoleucine is really a key mediator of these effects. Okay. Um, and so presumably it'd be even easier to make an impossible burger with low isoleucine. Right. Have you looked at the pathways? I mean, do, do you look at the pathways where the, the protein restriction and the isoleucine restriction kind of follow, you activate the same? Um, they def there are definitely some similarities. Um, there's also a lot of differences, um, probably not surprising since a protein restricted diet has lower levels of 19 other amino acids um, as compared to isoleucine. Some of the major uh, similar effects may be mediated by a hormone called FGF21. Um, which uh, promotes energy expenditure. It's also uh, found in humans and mice. It promotes browning and beijing of white adipose tissue. Um, seems to have some metabolic benefits in humans as well. Um, people have tried to make FGF21 activators as drugs for type 2 diabetes and obesity. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, so, so that's definitely some of the effects. Some of the effects are probably independent of that though. 
we have a couple of different uh, people in the lab working on genetic mapping projects to try and identify exactly what it is that regulates the response to dietary protein as well as isoleucine.